So good afternoon, um, and welcome to today's Wednesday afternoon lecture. Um, I'm Susan Gottesman, and I'm representing the Lambda Lunch Interest Group. For those of you who don't know, that's the prokaryotic um, seminar series that's been going on at NIH even longer than the evolution of your E. coli has been going on <laughs> since, since the early 70s. Um, and we're very excited today to have Richard Lenski as, as our speaker. So most of us who work on bacteria, I think, partially work on it because things happen very quickly. And we can you know, do an exper think of an experiment one day and have results on, on plates the next day, um, and then think about it for a while and maybe do another experiment. So, so Richard Lenski has been taking our, the bacteria that we all love and doing really tough and long experiments to ask very basic questions about evolution. And he's, he's um, going to tell you a lot about that. And you'll, you'll see what a, what a beautiful story it's developed into. His work has been um, recognized with a variety of honors from a MacArthur uh, Fellowship in 96, uh, a cat election to the American Academy of Microbiology, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Fellowship in uh, American Association for Advancement of Science, and uh, already four years ago, election to the National Academy. Um, and he's sort of our premier uh, bacterial evolution uh, person, and we're really excited to have him here and to have him talk to us. And those of you who, who are, want to hear more after, at the end of the seminar, one, there'll be a reception, but two, tomorrow uh, we'll host a second talk at Lambda Lunch, which is at 11 o'clock in Building 37. So if you don't already know where that is, um, just ask me or, or somebody else who works on bacteria here, and, and we'll direct you to it. So thank you, Richard. Thank you, Susan, and thanks also to Mike Cashel for organizing this visit. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to uh, uh, tell you about this experiment that's been going on in my laboratory uh, for quite a while. And it's really a very simple experiment. It, it's one that maybe has a little bit of patience involved, as Susan said, keeping it going. But there's the experiment, just 12 little Erlenmeyer flasks uh, that we've been cultivating for about 20 years. But I wanted to I wanted to step back, and, and, and I know most of you aren't primarily evolutionary biologists, and just sort of remind you of the sweep of, of ways of thinking about evolution as a process. And I think many of us first encounter the idea of evolution when we're children and go to museums and see wonderful fossils like the dinosaurs or the trilobites or human an ancestors. Or we well, don't really see it at the museums, but that's a wonderful uh, uh, prokaryotic fossil from a couple of billion years ago. So that's one of the ways that we study evolution, is by looking into the past for remnants of once living organisms. The way in which I think all biologists nowadays use evolution is in terms of the comparative method. Even if they're not explicitly uh, engaged in, in comparative studies, all of the information that we as biologists collect is in some sense organized around the tree of life. Uh, and um, certainly since Carl Woese, uh, uh, his work uh, showed the prokaryotes split into these two deeply divergent domains of the bacteria and archaea. You know, we now look at things like the distribution of archaea in geographical space or the convergent evolution of, uh, of focusing eyes in, in cephalopod mollusks and, and mammals and so on. That information, understanding whether things arose once or many times in evolution, is hung and interpreted on the phylogenetic tree of life. The third way we study evolution is in terms of the process of evolution and action. And the picture on the upper left is of, um, of pigeons. And Darwin, in The Origin of Species, talked about domestication and the idea of artificial selection, and used that in the second chapter of The Origin as a bridge into the idea of natural selection. And certainly, agricultural crops like maize into corn and so on, this process has happened over many human generations, but with dramatic impact on our lives. 
Another way of studying evolution in action is in terms of molecular epidemiology, tracing the source and distribution of diseases. So in the upper right, this is rather old now, but you can see years of isolation from 85 to 96 and sequence divergence of uh, one of the genes in influenza virus. This work was done by Walter Fitch a number of years ago. And so one can see evolution in time over the course of human lives. And because evolution is a process that is still ongoing, it's possible to do experiments. And so that's what I'll, I'll be describing today is this one long-term experiment. I also wanted to just step back and quote Charles Darwin. This is the last uh, sentence of The Origin of Species where he says, there's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while the planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, so physics just this fixed boring stuff, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So even though he really is mostly talking about evolution in the past tense from a comparative standpoint, he emphasizes very much that evolution is an ongoing process. Just finally, before launching into the details of the talk, I did want to just mention a few ways in which the notion of evolution as an ongoing process really is part of our lives and part of our, our, uh, uh, our social uh, 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 needs. And, and one is just basic science. It's a way of understanding and observing the world in which we live to take this process that is view, usually viewed as something too slow to observe, but under the right circumstances, as I'll describe today, you can actually see the process occurring. As I mentioned, it's extremely important in terms of tracking the source of emerging pathogens, understanding the evolution of resistance to antibiotics, and so on. And really, it, it's, it's quite amazing. I've, I've never seen a direct calculation of this, but I think in terms of what the pharmaceutical and uh, agricultural industries spend in terms of trying to keep up the evolution, the sums must be quite staggering. Also, we humans are changing the world, climate, land use, invasive species, and so on. And it's of interest to ask how quickly the organisms will be able to respond to some of the challenges that we create by changing the world. And finally, although many engineers like the idea of biotechnology that everything can be, once you understand sequences and functions, everything can be precisely engineered, I know of a growing number of biotechnology groups that are moving more towards an open-ended evolution approach where they try to structure the selection as much as the actual genetic constitution of the organisms and let evolution do the hard work of figuring out how to solve important problems. So I was trained as a field ecologist. I did my PhD working on insects in, 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 in forests in the southern Appalachians. But I was always interested in this interface between ecology and evolution. And so I was looking for a system where I could watch evolution in action and really test hypotheses. And E. coli is an obvious model system for evolutionary biology in the same way that it's been a wonderful model system for so much work in molecular genetics and microbial uh, systems of all sorts. It's easy to grow and count. You can manipulate and control the environments. You can vary temperature, resources, the presence or absence of predators like phage and so on. And obviously, one of the attractions when I made that switch was the rapid generations, the fact that I can stand up and talk about an experiment that's been going on for thousands of generations. I do want to mention that in this experiment that I'm going to describe today, everything is strictly clonal. In nature, bacteria have mechanisms including uh, 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 transformation, transduction, conjugation, and so on for horizontal gene transfer. But none of that is happening in the experiment I'll describe today. What I don't think I fully appreciated when I started this experiment was the importance of being able to freeze strains. When I look at some of my colleagues who do evolution experiments with Drosophila and so on, you're always forced to have a control population and treatment populations. And of course, the controls are continuing to evolve and change in ways. Uh, whereas here, we're able to, basically all the data I think that I'm going to show you today, all of the cells that we're comparing are compared at the same point in time as part of a proper replicated experiment, even though some of them were generated many thousands of generations earlier. So by freezing the ancestor and the intermediate genotypes, we can then bring them out and do, for example, head-to-head -head competitions. We can ask how much more fit in the environment that I'll describe momentarily where the experiment has been conducted, how much more fit or how much more competitive are the later generations than the earlier ones. 
Now you might say, well, how are you going to compete the evolved and ancestral genotypes? How will you tell them apart? And I don't want to go into too many of the details, but we have a color marker system where uh, we can compete evolved bacteria that are red against white ancestors or evolved bacteria that are white against red ancestors. And this is a genetic marker that we've shown is selectively neutral. So it's not affecting fitness, but by competing these different types, we can generate estimates of how much more fit one is than the other. And of course, because E. coli has served as a model system for all these other fields for so many decades, there's a tremendous wealth of molecular and cellular data, as well as genetic and, and molecular approaches that can be used to help guide and inform the interpretation of this experiment. So here is the experiment. As I said, it's just these 12 simple Erlenmeyer flasks. Each one contains 10 mils of a simple uh, glucose-limited minimal medium. They were all started, except for this color marker, they were all started from the same ancestral strain, and they've been propagated for 20-some years now by every day taking one-tenth of a milliliter and diluting it into 10 mils, or a 1 to 100 daily transfer dilution. Glucose is the limiting source, of, uh, is the limiting uh, resource, uh, and if you think about this daily 100-fold dilution and regrowth, that corresponds to approximately 6.6 .6 binary division, cell divisions per day. So that's how we calculate the number of generations. Because it's a serial transfer experiment, every day the populations go from yesterday's stationary phase, where they've depleted the glucose, into a lag phase when they're transferred into fresh medium, followed by exponential growth, followed by resource depletion in stationary phase, and every 24 hours that repeats. Now, in this medium, and I do, for reasons I won't go into, um, I worked at a quite low glucose concentration, much lower than a typical microbiology lab would work in. Uh, and the medium also contains a second carbon source in it, which is citrate. But a diagnostic feature of E. coli as a species that goes back uh, many, many decades, really, I think, to the original description of E. coli, is that it cannot transport citrate into cells in an oxic environment. And that, the reason that will become relevant uh, later in the talk. I started this experiment in 1988, and now it's over 50,000 generations. That was me last year doing the transfers for the, the uh, 50,000th generation. And if you work through the calculations of the population size, genome size, mutation rate, it's fair to say that every population has had billions of mutations, far more than there are, in fact, nucleotides in the genome. But how many, and it's far, far fewer than that, how many substitutions, how many think, mutations along the line of descent leading to sort of the winners at the end have there been? And as I said, there's this frozen fossil record, uh, and we have the ancestors and samples stored every 500 generations. So you might say, why the heck did you do this experiment? And over lunch, I was discussing some of this with a wonderful set of postdocs and graduate students here. So, um, one of my interests in evolution has been this tension between the forces that might be viewed as stochastic, like mutation as a random process, and random genetic drift, or the sampling across generations, with the role of selection, natural selection, picking out the same phenotypes and perhaps the same underlying genotypes. So will populations, if they start in this adaptive landscape, will they evolve to the same sort of more or less similar or even identical solutions to the challenges, or will some of them discover more interest or more unusual, atypical uh, responses. So I was interested in the reproducibility of evolutionary outcomes, and I like to describe this experiment. I know many of you know the Lurie and Delbruck uh, uh, fluctuation test from the 1940s. That's my all-time favorite experiment. It was one of these one-day experiments in some sense. I like to think of this experiment as, well, what if we let the Lurie and Delbruck experiment go for a few decades? I'm also interested in the dynamics of evolution. Is improvement going to be slow and gradual in the traditional way that it's often expressed for Darwinian theory, or are there periods of rapid change and perhaps periods where very little is happening? I'm also interested in the couplings of genetic and phenotypic evolution. Are they very tightly coupled? If you look at the level of genome, is most of this just random drift and inconsequential, or are most of the genomic changes actually producing adaptations? So I will try to answer uh, at least in part, all of these questions. So I'm going to begin by o with an overview of some of the data that we gathered, really pre-genomic and in many ways, ways pre-genetic, where we were looking at the phenotypic changes that occurred in these populations. So as I said, one of the things we can measure is fitness. 
Now, when I talk about fitness, you might say, well, these might be fit in the laboratory, but they're probably not fit in nature. And that's exactly right. I'm using fitness in the context of the environment in which the evolution experiment occurred. And this is showing the dynamics for one of the 12 populations just over the first 2,000 generations of evolution expressed relative to the ancestor. So by definition, at time zero, the relative fitness is one. And what you see, and I'm not going to go into all the statistics, but instead of a nice smooth increase, it actually, you see these significant, and it's statistically significant easily, these sort of quasi-stair step-like dynamic, where it's kind of got periods of rapid change and periods of stasis. And this has been much debated in the evolutionary biology literature, and what I want to emphasize here is that it has the world's simplest possible interpretation. If you think about a beneficial mutation in E. coli, let's say one that gives a 10% advantage in growth rate relative to its predecessor, it takes about 30 generations for that to go from one in a million, say, to one in 100,000. It takes another 30 generations to go to one in 10,000. And the point is, it's something that gives a 10% advantage is having no measurable effect on the mean property of the population until it becomes a significant minority, maybe one or 10% of the population. And then suddenly, in a relatively few generations, it might go from being one in 10 to one to one to 10 to one of that type. And so the mathematics of natural selection, in fact, predict this kind of dynamic. And these steps of about 10% correspond to the biggest beneficial mutations in this simple environment uh, that we saw, at least in the early going and in most of the populations. Longer term, and now I'm showing the same population with some recent work done by Mike Weiser, a graduate student in my lab, over all 50,000 generations, far less replication, but what I want to emphasize in all 12 populations shows something similar, which is that the rate of improvement is slowing down. It's not stopping, but it's definitely been decelerating over the course of this experiment. Now, what about this question of how reproducible it is? What if instead of competing population one, for example, against its ancestor, like I just showed in the previous slide, what if we compete population one against population two and do that over these 50,000 generations? This is the kind of data that you get. You can see that maybe the population in the denominator was a little bit more fit, so fitness of these two evolving populations dropped below one, then the fitness of the population in the numerator was a little bit higher, so it wasn't perfectly reproducible. But now plot these relative fitnesses of two lines against one another on the same scale where we plotted the improvement of one of them against the ancestor. So here we're seeing about an 80% improvement. And here, these two lines are improving in such a similar rate that, in fact, they never deviate by more than a few percent from one another. So at this level, in terms of the gestalt phenotype of how competitive they are in the environment that they've been evolving, evolution is extremely reproducible. What about some other phenotypes? So again, I'm just going to march through a few of these. One of the interesting phenotypes that we have seen evolving in all of these populations is the cells are becoming larger. That's perhaps a little counterintuitive that the, they're growing faster and the individual cells are becoming larger. If you had asked me what they should do, I would have said they should have done do the other thing, but in terms of surface to volume considerations, but clearly the bacteria had other plans in mind. And all 12 populations make cells that are typically twice as large or more uh, than the ancestor. Some changes also in cell shape. They're more variable in their cell size than they are in their fitness, but still the direction of evolution has been the same in all 12 populations. Another interesting phenotype that we saw evolving, and this was work done by a former postdoc, Paul Snigowski, now at Penn, um, on the faculty there, is that um, we see that the mutation rates, not the amount of standing variation, but the actual rate at which new mutations are appearing, has been evolving in some of our populations. And to do that, we performed these experiments that I mentioned at the very outset, the Luria-Delbrook fluctuation tests. And we could measure the mutation rate at a number of loci where we had easily scored markers, various antibiotic and phage resistance ones. And we see that the ancestor, and this work was done at generation 10,000, and we see that the ancestor and nine of the evolved lineages have similar low mutation rates on the order of 10 to the minus 10th at this particular locus, probably a single base pair creating all those changes. But three of our populations had mutation rates perhaps two orders of magnitude higher. They had evolved mutator phenotypes, 
And we were able to, it's actually kind of ironic that I think one of the first genes that we were able to do formal genetics on was one that was affecting the rate of evolution everywhere else in the genome. And that's because these were loss of function mutations in DNA repair pathways, and in particular the methyl-directed mismatch repair pathway. And we were able to do that by essentially cloning the, and actually getting from other labs, uh, clones, plasmids that had the wild type allele on them and show that they restored the mutation rate. So here's one that's MUDAS being restored to the low ancestral mutation rate. And we could go into the freezer and see when these transitions from wild type to mutator phenotypes had occurred. Now that we're 50,000 generations in, at least six of the 12 populations have acquired various mutator phenotypes. And I'll show some of the effects of that on genomic evolution shortly. What else can we look at? Well, another set of phenotypes that we looked at were using biolog plates. Uh, uh, these are 90, well, they've changed formats over the years, but the ones we used are these 96 well plates where each well has an indicator of growth as well as a different carbon source. And as I said, the, pack, the populations evolved on glucose, and we looked to see whether the replicate lines were becoming defective in their ability to grow on other resources. Now, to the extent that your eye sees red much more than green over here, that's an indication of cases in which there was, across generations 2,000, 10,000, and 20,000 when we did this, it's an indication of the degree to which they are becoming less and less fit on these alternative carbon sources. I want to hasten to add, however, it's not as though they've just deleted these genes. There are very, very few cases where they've lost the capacity to grow on other resources. Generally, what they've done is slightly lower yields, slightly lower growth rates. So the message of that is that by evolving in this extremely constant environment, they have become, in some sense, ecological specialists with quite a narrowed niche in terms of their uh, potential carbon sources. Another set of phenotypes, getting closer and closer to the genetics, as it were, is uh, looking at the transcription profiles. And this was work led by a former postdoc, Tim Cooper, now at Houston in my lab. And, and when people were starting to be able to do transcriptional profiles at reasonable cost, he came to me and said, oh, I really want to do this. And I, I'm very statistically minded, and I was kind of worried. I said, okay, E. coli's got roughly 4,000 genes. These exp experiments are expensive to run. You know, if you apply statistics to that, say a 0.05 probability level with 4,000 genes, we're going to end up with a couple hundred false positives. I'm sure that's more than the number of mutations we have. You know, how are we going to sort out the, the real signal from the noise in this case? But we discussed this for a while, and we realized that this evolution experiment design gave us an interesting opportunity to kind of filter on the most important changes in the transcriptional profile. And what, I, what we decided was to let's only look at those cases, at least as a first pass, where two independently evolved lineages, each at the 0.05 level, showed significant changes relative to independent measurements made on their ancestor. And if you think about two, requiring 0.05 level significance in two separate experiments, you actually are expecting maybe only on the order of half a dozen or so false positives to make it through two independent experiments. Well, in fact, we found not just half a dozen, we found 59 cases where these two replica independently evolved populations had changed significantly the level of expression. I didn't say anything about whether they had to be both up, both down, or could be one of each, so we had a nice a posteriori test we could do and ask whether they had changed in the same direction. And in fact, in every one of these 59 cases, the direction of change in one line predicted the direction of change in the other line. And the probability of that having happened by chance is extremely small. So the net effect, and maybe I'll try to walk through this, this is a summary of the data where we're looking at, here what I'm plotting is across log scale, several orders of magnitude, gene transcription, this was based on hybridization uh, to uh, nylon membranes. Um, uh, <clears throat> what we're looking at is the level of expression in this red ancestor relative to the level of expression in the white ancestor. Nothing else genetically differs between them. This is an average of, I think, four replicates on each of the, three or four replicates on each of those genotypes. And this, in a sense, is our measurement error. This is saying that across several orders of magnitude, we can see quite a wide range and a high correlation of gene expression in independent experiments. If we now take one of the lines after 20,000 generations and compare it to its ancestor, I hope you can see there's much more scatter. Things are changing these 59 cases. 
If we look at another one of the evolved populations relative to its ancestor, you also see there's much more scatter. What if we now look at the two independently evolved lines relative to one another? So each one of them is 20,000 generations removed from the ancestor. They're 40,000 generations, therefore, removed from one another. They are actually significantly more similar to one another than either is relative to its ancestor. So it's saying at the level of the entire global transcription profile, not that everything is identical, but just like we saw for the fitness trajectories and the cell size, there's quite a lot of reproducible evolution occurring there. So now what I want to do, and I've summarized lots of work by lots of students and postdocs, I want to switch from phenotypes to genetics. So first of all, just to reiterate, why did I want to, why do we, I'm, as I said, more of an evolutionary biologist. Do we really need to get at the genetics? Sometimes when we were frustrated, I wasn't sure. Uh, but uh, what we really wanted to do was ask whether the phenotypic parallelism would extend to the genetic levels. Is it the same biochemical pathways that are evolving in these replicate populations? Is it the same genes? Might we actually have many cases where the same nucleotide is evolving in these replicate populations? Also, I showed you some tra trajectories for uh, phenotypic evolution of cell size and fitness. How similar are the dynamics of phenotypic evolution to the dynamics of change in the genome? And as I said at the outset, are most of these genetic changes neutral or are they really the stuff of adaptation that is improving the competitiveness of these bacteria? The problem was how to find them. E. coli is a wonderful model system, but it actually was quite frustrating for a number of years to make much progress understanding the genetic basis of the change. Perhaps we had, I estimated sort of on some theoretical grounds that after, say, the first decade, we might have something like between 10 and 100 mutations in a typical uh, uh, cell after that point in time, one of the non-mutators at least. Genomes on the order of 5 million base pairs. Much of E. coli genetics, and microbial genetics, is based on gains and losses of function that allow one to do things like complementation tests. But here we were looking for mutations that gave one a 5% growth rate advantage or a 10% growth rate advantage. It was very difficult to find the underlying genes. Sometimes we got lucky because there would be an evolved phenotype, like a loss of a catabolic function or the loss of the methyl-directed mismatch repair. But more generally, I like to joke that whenever I'd give talks to microbiology audiences, whoever had been studying Pathway X for the last 30 years would come up afterwards and say, I'm sure that's what's going on. And, and really, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, because what is fitness other than the integration of all the genetic components and physiological manifestations thereof in the cell that determine how well they replicate in a given environment? replicate and survive. Nonetheless, with a whole bunch of talented students and collaborators, by focusing on one of these lines, we were able to find 12 substitutions, 12 mutations that had been fixed in one of these lineages that was the focus of our genetics work. Now, of course, in the last few years, it's become possible to do whole genome sequencing and resequencing and do so at a cost that we can begin to apply to an experiment of this scale. Actually, our first challenge was to sequence our ancestral uh, genome because what we really wanted to do was find the changes relative to the ancestral starting point. So quite a lot of work went into getting a completely closed and I think absolutely perfect uh, reference genome for that. And from that, and that work was led by Jihoon Kim at the Korean Research Institute for Biology and Biotechnology. And with Jihoon and Jeff Barrick, a postdoc in my lab who will be on the faculty at UT Austin starting next semester, uh, the first the first paper we did on this, which appeared in Nature last year, was to sequence clones, individual cells in essence, but grown out as a colony, from generations 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, and I'll show you a little later, 40,000 generations. And what I've represented is all the mutations as they are found on this circle diagram, where the inner circle is our reference genome, the next circle out is the 2,000 generation clone, the next one after that, the 5,000 generation clone, and so on. And maybe some of you are looking for your favorite genes up here, but don't, don't try to look. I don't want to emphasize the different names up here, but I will just mention these include mutations in protein coding regions as well as intergenic regions. They include deletions shown in red, IS element insertions shown as blues, and there's an inversion that rose, I guess, between uh, five and 10,000 uh, that's about one-third of the chromosome.
So by 20, oh, and I also would call your attention to the fact that you'll see it wasn't just sort of scattershot mutations. Once we found a mutation in an early generation, it almost always persisted into a later generation. So you see these bands going from the center outward. So at 45 generations, this particular clone had 29 point mutations and 15 indels or insertions and deletions and this one very large inversion. What was striking to me as an evolutionary biologist was how constant the rate of genomic evolution had been. So you can actually take the number of mutations we saw at 20,000 generations, that number 45, and do a Monte Carlo simulation where you do, say, a million times, throw down 45 mutations at random over time, and you can create 95% confidence bands for the number of mutations if the underlying rate of fixation of those mutations was constant, and none of our points lie outside that confidence band. Now, when you see near linear, with, within the limits of statistical resolution, linear accumulation of mutations, every molecular evolutionist will tell you that's the signature of neutral evolution. That's the signature of things just drifting, not in terms of Darwinian adaptation by natural selection, as it would be usually understood at the genomic level. But remember, I also showed you that mean fitness was improving greatly over the same period. So we know at least some of those mutations were creating these fitness benefits. But was it a small minority of them, just a handful of these 40-some mutations that were creating the benefit? Or were the vast majority of these substitutions, in fact, beneficial? So I'm going to present four different ways of answering that question. How does one distinguish, in a system like this, the accumulation of mutations by just recurrent mutation, random genetic drift, versus those that are this, uh, um, the result of adaptation by natural selection. And I'm going to proceed maybe from the weakest inferences to the strongest inferences, but I think they each sort of tell something interesting about the dynamics that's occurring here. So one is the question of substitutions versus transient polymorphisms. You might say, well, I'll bet every single clone you pulled out of that population would have had a bunch of mutations that none of the others or not all of the other cells had. So maybe what we're really looking at is just a whole bunch of standing genetic variation which is constantly being generated. Well, remember I showed you that almost all the mutations that we see that occurred in earlier generations are fixed and maintained in the population in later, later generations. So that suggests they're at least substitutions. Now, they could have been hitchhiking random mutations drip by, that are neutral, hitchhiking with beneficial mutations, but at least it points us towards, it looks like a lot of these are being driven by natural selection. So in total, um, I forget what, how this all totals up, but the vast majority of mutations were on what I would call the line of descent, this progression from earlier generations to later generations. Interestingly, there were a total, of, and if you look through here, there are a total of 11 mutations that don't lie on the line of descent that appeared in an earlier generation and aren't there later. Amazingly, three of those are in this subset of only 40-some genes where there was a later another allele substituted. So in other words, these, at least some of these that even don't lie on the line of descent had risen to high frequency but had been excluded by a phenomenon called clonal interference. H.J. Muller, the famous geneticist, first described this as the idea that in an asexual population, Let's say our ancestral genotype is little a, little b in this haploid organism for two loci, or maybe even two different sites within the same gene. Maybe a beneficial mutation appears in this cell and it begins to expand because it's a beneficial mutation. Another beneficial mutation occurs elsewhere in the genome or even in the same gene and it begins to expand. But because they're asexual, they can't be brought together into the same genome and they end up competing with one another and you can only ex uh, you can only derive the double mutant by a process of sequential mutation and selection, not by recombination. So this fact that many of these alleles that are off the line of descent are in the same loci where fixations occurred is also a very interesting indirect argument that it's being driven by natural selection. Now, any of you who've done molecular evolution will say, well, tell me about synonymous and non-synonymous substitutions, because the classic case of thinking about uh, uh, neutral evolution is positions in the genetic code w when they're mutate in the genome when they're mutated don't change a protein sequence even though they're in a protein coding region. So there were a total of 22 point mutations in, these, in this particular lineage that went to fixation and every single one of them is non-synonymous. There's not a single synonymous substitution that occurred over these 
uh, 20,000 generations. Now, when people do molecular evolution, if you see a ratio in a single gene of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations that's significantly greater than one, that's often sort of taken as evidence that this gene is one that's undergoing positive selection for some change in function. Here we see that signal, not just in a single gene, but across the entire genome. A third line of evidence that it's being driven by selection is, is deals with this parallelism or the convergence or divergence at the uh, sequence level. So we're now in the process of sequencing many more genomes. So this work is slightly, um, is based on what we did was when we found mutations in this one population, we began to sequence those same loci in all of the populations. So we've, at the time at least this slide was prepared, we had sequenced 14 genes where this lineage had a mutation, we had sequenced those genes in all other 11 lines. Three of those 14 genes have mutations in every single one of the other lines. So this is showing a gene called NADR, another called PYKF, where every one of our 12 populations has a single non-synonymous substitution in that uh, gene. Um, nine others, we have at least two other lineages that have picked up mutations in that gene. So of these 14, where we found mutations in line one, we found only two of those genes that haven't yet evolved and changed from the ancestor in any of the other populations. By contrast, if we just choose genes at random, we've done that for, this was work led by Peg Riley uh, and Dom Schneider, a wonderful uh, collaborator uh, from France, we sequenced 36 genes chosen at random, and not one of them had mutations in more than a single lineage. So the distribution of parallel changes, once you find a change in one of the populations, it's not a perfect predictor, but it's highly predictive of likelihood of change in the other 11 lineages, whereas that is not at all true for simply randomly chosen chunks of the genome. So I've presented three lines of evidence. These are substitutions, they're non-synonymous, and they're convergent across the replicate populations. The ACID test is to make genotypes that differ only by this mutation. So do manipulative genetics. It's not always easy because, again, we don't have discrete phenotypes uh, that are readily screened. But we've done this now for nine of those loci where there's a mutation in our reference population. And we've done nine isogenic pairs where everything is identical except for the mutation of interest and this color marker. And in eight of those nine, we actually see that they confer significant selective advantages in head-to-head -head competitions where everything is the same except that. So by all four of these criteria, selection has been much more powerful force than random genetic drift in sculpting the genomes over these 50, over the, actually at this point I've talked about the first 20,000 generations. And the reason I've only talked about the rate of 20,000 generations in this population Okay, I mentioned it was remarkably constant for the first 20,000 generations. This is one of those populations that picked up a defect in one of the genes that's involved in, in, uh, in a sense, the accuracy of DNA replication. A gene called MUT, which is the product of MUT, is involved in cleaning up some of the uh, nucleotides that could be misincorporated into the DNA and, and during further repair lead to heritable mutations. So between 20 and 30,000 generations, this lineage became overtaken by a, a sublineage, a clone, that had this T mutator. And at 40,000 generations, we were suddenly up to 646 mutations. So 45 in the first 20,000 generations, 646 by 40,000 generations. Many of these subs later changes were synonymous, in fact, very close to what you would predict based on the frequency of potential synonymous substitutions. And something like 90-some percent of them bore the specific sequence signature that molecular biologists had determined was the signature of defects in mute T. It was a frame shift mutation, I believe, in mute T, which is a particular kind of a transversion mutation. So here we have the same experiment. We're now later in that same experiment, the same organism and everything, and the balance between natural selection and random processes of drift and hitchhiking refers to random mutations that are hitchhiking along with occasional beneficial ones. The balance of these forces has been completely turned around due to a mutation in one particular gene. So I want to give a little bit of a partial summary at this point before I turn to a quite striking example of, of something that happened in one particular population. So I've noted that parallel genetic changes 
happened in many of these populations. I didn't really go into details, but many of these are very interesting genes affecting quite global properties of the cell physiology and biochemistry. Uh, Mike Cashel and I first met and got acquainted uh, because one of the, the loci uh, that has been evolving in many of our populations is one that's involved in stringent response. That and DNA topology uh, the degree of supercoiling of the DNA, these are some of the high-level processes that have been evolving in our populations. Be that as it may, these gene parallel genetic changes underlie the parallel phenotypic evolution. They cause these changes in the gene expression profiles, leading to this narrowing or the restriction of the catabolic ecological niche, that is increased specialization, leading to larger cell size, an improved rate and efficiency. I haven't really talked about efficiency, but these populations are also more efficient at converting the glucose into biomass. And that ultimately leads to improved competitive fitness. So again, this is an example of some of these parallel changes, the improvement in competitive fitness. At this point, I want to emphasize this is speculation, but one reason I think some of these global regulators may be changing is that when I first did this experiment and presented it to audiences that contained a lot of microbiologists, they said, well, I'll bet what you're gonna do is lose a lot of catabolic functions. They'll delete this chunk of the operon, I mean, this chunk of the genome, this operon in the genome, and so on. Um, but actually, if you think about two things about E. coli, one is the cost of DNA synthesis. There have been calculations of this. The actual savings of, of, of deleting a small bit of DNA is very, very small. The, the selection coefficients would be nowhere near as large as the kind we're measuring. And also E. coli, I think it's fair to say, is very efficient at down-regulating a lot of these functions when they're not actually being used uh, to enhance the growth rate of the cell. So the benefit of deleting, say, changing a one promoter at a time, or the benefit of changing, knocking out by deleting a particular operon, in general, I would expect these to be quite small. And I think what these global regulatory changes are probably doing is sort of turning the screws tighter and tighter on some of these unused catabolic functions, so that the lag time when you switch onto those resources is becoming longer, the efficiency is becoming a little less, the growth rate is becoming a little less, and so by a relatively few mutations, taking advantage of the global architecture of the E. coli cell that was already present in our ancestor, what we're really doing is evolving E. coli that are extreme specialists on glucose, but rather conservative in their uh, taste for alternative resources and their ability to respond to altered conditions. So what I've shown you then is that these populations started from an ancestor in this fitness landscape, and they're not following the exact path, but they're sort of scaling Mount Glucose in very similar ways. But then something interesting happened way into the experiment. After 30,000 generations, one of these 12 populations evolved the ability to use citrate and it became much more dense. It became much more dense because remember I said that there's not actually that much glucose in our medium. So when we first saw how turbid this culture was, we thought we'd gotten a citrate positive contaminate into the flask. Um, as I mentioned, a diagnostic feature of E. coli as a species is it can't transport citrate into the cell under oxic conditions. We quickly checked genetic markers for some of our easily scored phenotypic markers and then genetic markers, absolutely not a contaminant. This was de novo evolution of the ability to transport citrate into the cell under these oxic conditions. Interestingly, even though it had this extra resource, the citrate positive cells didn't drive extinct the citrate minus cells within the same population. They coexist so that if you mix them at different ratios, the two types stably coexist with one another because the ones that grow on the citrate have a longer lag when they switch back to growing on glucose when they're transferred into the fresh medium every day, and they also have a slightly uh, slower maximum growth rate on glucose, or at least they did when they first evolved. So they stably coexist, one of them with this novel phenotype, one with more typical uh, phenotype of just growing on the glucose. Now, we tried to do a lot of genetics on this, obvious thing would be let's try to P1 transduce the ability to, to grow on uh, citrate. And we were completely unsuccessful in those efforts. Now that's maybe not too surprising because if it involves multiple alleles that are widely separated on the chromosome or if it involves something like an inversion or some unusual mutation, it might well not readily be transduced. So that formal genetics was not simple. But being evolutionary biologists, we said, can we design an evolution experiment that can distinguish between two hypotheses? 
And I'll call those hypotheses sort of an extremely rare mutation or alternatively historical contingency. Now remember I said that if you calculate the number of cell generations and the population sizes and the mutation rate, pretty much every point mutation would have occurred many times over in every one of these populations. So if all you needed was one particular point mutation, they all should have become it long before 30,000 generations. But possibly the mutation is some sort of inversion, say that it has to be exactly at this endpoint and exactly at this endpoint, and maybe that doesn't have a mutation rate that scales at all like a typical point mutation rate. So maybe it's simply the case that any of the 12 populations at any point in time, you know, one of them eventually discovers this unusual mutation, but there's nothing special about the population that evolved that ability. So that's the rare mutation hypothesis. The historical contingency hypothesis says that the emergence required of this new phenotype required not only a particular mutation that sort of at that moment created this new phenotype, but also a genetic background that would allow that new phenotype, for example, to be expressed. So it was dependent on some prior mutations that set up an epistatic context in which this mutation, the final mutation, could lead to this new phenotype. And so that's what I mean by historical contingency, so that the phenotypically defined mutation rate has changed over the course of this particular lineage. This historical contingency can be represented here on this sort of uh, evolutionary biologists love these uh, fitness landscapes. So we have an ancestor that's sort of arbitrarily poorly adapted. It's climbing Mount Glucose. They're doing things quite similarly, but there's this other adaptive solution that could enhance fitness even more in this environment, but they're being driven up to this local maximum. But maybe one of our populations, by virtue of the path it took, kind of got into the shoulder, where was it at a cusp? and had the potential to evolve this new phenotype. Any of you who have read the late great historian of science and paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould might be thinking of this experiment, which he talked about it as replaying life's tape. So what he's thinking of is what this picture is of a, of a, of, of a wonderful fossil bed in Canada it's called the Burgess Shale. It's associated with this period in evolutionary history called the Cambrian Explosion, which is sort of a period around, I don't know exactly what time people say now, maybe 540, 560 million years ago, when suddenly many of the uh, uh, animal uh, metazoan body plans are evidence in this fossil bed, and yet you go a few hundred, a hundred million years before that, basically you're seeing none of this multicellularity. And so he's saying, wouldn't it be really, and you see some, some of these body plans don't seem to have modern living relatives, and he's saying, well, what if we could go back in time and start evolution from, you know, maybe the time of that Cambrian explosion and let evolution replay itself, how would it come out? You know, would there be anything like what, you know, we think of as intelligent humans or any kind of, any kind of uh, uh, organism that would be at all like ourselves? And he says the bad news is that, so that's the sort of a, great, 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 great grandma. So he says the bad news is we can't possibly perform the experiment. And unless you have a really big grant and several replicant planets, I guess you can't. But on a smaller scale, we can do exactly this because we have a freezer full of the predecessors to the time at which the citrate ability to transport it and grow had emerged. So what we did was we went back into our freezer, picked clones, from all the way from time zero out to just before the phenotype had emerged. And I want to emphasize we're picking clones because we're not asking at what point in time did the rare variant actually show up. We actually want to ask about the genetic potential of different genetic backgrounds to give rise to this new phenotype. That's Zach Blount, heroic graduate student who did the experiment. These are a few of the Petri dishes that he used in several sets of experiments, which I'm going to try to describe and summarize. So what we were looking for was mutations to the SIT plus phenotype, and he did that with several dozen clones that were isolated at generation zero, 5,000, 10,000. He particularly sampled around the time that the phenotype uh, had arisen. And these are all from different time points in the lineage that eventually evolved the ability to use citrate. His experiment encompassed over 40 trillion cells. I think that's one of the larger experiments. Uh, so four times 10 to the 13th, we're up there with the physicist. It involved, this was I think about a third of the Petri dishes. He stored them for a year in the cold room just to convince his committee that he was working hard. So, all, and by the way, all of these are not done simultaneously, but again, one of the beauties of this sort of experiment is if he's looking at these different genotypes that were sampled at different points in time, 
he's not comparing data that he collected in August with data he collected in February, and you might say, well, the water changed or something like that. What he's doing is he's pulling all of these genotypes out, growing them up in large independent replicate flasks, and then plating them on a minimal citrate agar where there's nothing to grow on other than the citrate, and asking whether they have the potential to generate mutants that can grow on minimal citrate medium. He left them sitting for a month. And then when there were colonies, obviously, occasionally got a few contaminants, but any confirmed one he would check to make sure it was the right genotype. He would test it on something called Christensen's uh, citrate agar, which are these ones that give the color to, and so on. So very careful work. And, and he looked at a total, and because he was doing these sort of blocks of different time courses, we always included the ancestor as a control in all of these experiments. And he looked at a total of about 10 to the 13 ancestral cells not a single one gave a citrate positive mutant. So at the very least, he has the tightest confidence interval around the value of zero in the history of genetics. But luckily, it was much better than that. His experiment was a great success. Although the ancestor never produced a sit positive mutant, nor any of the clones he isolated before generation 20,000, he actually got 19 citrate positive mutants from these replay experiments. They were all generated by clones from 20,000 generations or later, and most of them were actually generated by clones from around 29,000 generations and later. You might say, well, is this one of your populations that had become a mutator? No, this population had not become a mutator, although interestingly, it has become one in the citrate lineage after it evolved that, but not for several thousand gener or a couple thousand generations later. What I want to call your attention to also, so first of all, the fact that he can't get them in some set of backgrounds and can in others is fully consistent, in fact, statistically supports the historical contingency argument. But this rate of ni only 19 out of all those cells um, that uh, were from the later generation suggests even here an extremely low mutation rate, something on the order of 10 to the minus 12th uh, per cell per generation. And again, that's giving them a full month to make a citrate positive a colony that can be seen with the eye. So it's almost certainly not a simple point mutation. We're in the process now of doing genetic and genomic analyses to understand the mutations that created this ability. What I've summarized, I think, makes you realize there are multiple mutations. That is, there's some mutation that led to the ability to grow on the citrate, but it also was contextual in depending on the genetic background in order for the propensity to either produce that mutational event or the propensity for that mutational event once it occurred to allow a phenotype that would permit growth on minimal citrate medium. So an experiment that's gone on for 20 years has had many, many people involved in it, and I've listed not all of them, but I've had wonderful graduate students and postdocs and collaborators. I tried to name a few of them, but I also wanted specifically to mention uh, three individuals. I've had, over these 20-some years, I've been really lucky to have a succession of three uh, wonderful technicians who kind of keep the lab going through thick and thin and manage this freezer collection. Uh, Sue Simpson, when I was at the University of California, Irvine, then Lynette Ikunwe was my first technician at Michigan State. State, and for the last 11 years, uh, Nirja Hajala has been just a fantastic uh, technician. So I th thank you all for coming, and uh, Susan and Mike for the wonderful invitation, and try to answer questions. I guess the question is, would, would amplifications, duplications be relatively invisible if those were the historical contingencies? Um, so that's a great question, and I'll be talking a little bit about this at, uh, at the Lambda lunch tomorrow. So it is very clear. So with these high throughput resequencing techniques, they are wonderful at finding SNPs. Um, but the reads are very short, and um, uh, the bioinformatics I don't think is fully developed for finding some of these non-standard point mutation, uh, non-standard mutations. So the postdoc I mentioned earlier, Jeff Barrick, has developed a pipeline called BreeSeq for bacterial resequencing, where he has applied a lot of bioinformatics to be able to find almost all classes of mutations. So, for instance, if it finds a and so like with the Illumina short reads, if it finds a read that doesn't match anything in the genome, but it matches two parts of the genome, 
it will then query other reads that don't match the genome to see whether they predict the same juncture. So it can find IS element insertions. It can find, by loss of coverage, you can find deletions. Uh, amplifications are tricky, but by read coverage, in principle, can be found. But many of these non-point mutations, one has to go in there and design primers and sort of look for the new junctions. So I think in the rearrangements that I did talk about, most or all of those have been confirmed by that sort of approach. So two questions about mutators. Yes. The, the first is that um, once a line has uh, evolved to become a mutator, have you looked to see whether that's a, a, a compens there's compensatory balances between what one would infer would be a, the disadvantage of a mutator and the mutations that have subsequently be, been involved by removing the mutator again? That's a wonderful question, and again, I'll present some data on that at Lambda Lunch, but the answer is yes. Uh, some of, at least these T mutators, which I think are quite severe, we have picked up anti-mutators that change both the rate and the sequence signature by looking at the rates of accumulation of synonymous substitutions at different points in time, then going back and finding the compensatory mutations. And, and the way you phrased the question, I think, is absolutely perfect, that there's a tension with mutators between the rare beneficial mutation that creates the opportunity for these otherwise disadvantageous alleles to enter the population. They're disadvantageous because they are creating a genetic load of, of progeny that are more likely to be less fit than they are more fit, but it operates on the variance of the rare beneficial mutation. As the population's fitness sort of decel the rate of improvement decelerates, that balance between the pro-mutator and anti-mutator forces begins to shift. And at some point, when there are no more beneficial mutations to be had, or at least to be easily had, that are any larger than the genetic load, the best mutations will be those that begin to lower the genetic load. So I think the emergence of these compensatory mutations is also telling us a lot about the remaining magnitudes of potential candidate beneficial mutations. So, so a follow-up question to that. If that really was what's, if, 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 that would, if that's what's happening in the wild, wouldn't one expect the mutator genes to appear to be more rapidly evolving than, say, the bulk of the genome? And I, I don't think that, 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 that since, since they, they, they might be going through these cycles, of mutation to mutator, back mutation, suppression, et cetera? So I'm not going to be able to answer that definitively, and some of my literature may be a little out of date, but there is some evidence that some of these mutator alleles, because they also affect the capacity for recombination in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you have horizontal gene transfer, it's not so much that they back mutate, but often a segment brings the uh, uh, wild type allele in. And it raises to me a very interesting question in evolution about sort of the tension between short-term adaptation and long-term adaptation. My sense is that a lot of adaptation we see in the world around us, be it E. coli or many, many other species, is what I would call local adaptation. There's a phage in my gut, the E. coli become resistant to it, or some sort of short-term selection. But I think many of those are evolutionary dead ends. You're giving up something in order to solve a local problem. Whereas I think the deep phylogeny, as it were, of E. coli and many other species is much more conservative than what we see with sort of the twigs out at the evolutionary tree. So in a sense, what my experiment is doing is looking at many examples of this, this short-term local adaptation. Simple question. So why uh, cells become bigger? Wonderful question. Um, <clears throat> so let's see where, so I don't know the answer. Um, Almost all of those isogenic constructs I described that we made and showed they had a fitness advantage, at least those that we've looked at, which isn't all of them, also make larger cells. Uh, now, when I first presented some of that data on the cells becoming larger well over a decade ago, it was a talk at University of Michigan, and distinguished uh, microbial physiologist Fred Neidhart stood up and said, well, you know, since the 1950s, it's been known that the faster you grow E. coli, the larger the cells are. They're more packed with ribosomes, more haploid copies of the genome. So the, just faster growth, per se, makes bigger cells. And so the implication of his question was that 
what are we doing? We're sort of selecting for faster growing things, so maybe they're becoming bigger, just as simple, whatever the underlying physiology that creates that physiological relationship, we're recapitulating it in evolution. So when he asked that question and it sort of dawned on me, I said, oh, you must be right, but I didn't see any way of telling, testing that hypothesis. We were able to test that hypothesis, taking advantage of these things called chemostats, which are continuous culture devices, where we could grow our evolved bacteria in one chemostat, and one of our, I, our, I forget what I just said, the evolved one in one chemostat, the ancestor next to it in another chemostat, growing at the same rate, so we could control for the effects of growth rate, and our evolved guys were still larger. So it wasn't only that effect. We did, so in other words, if we looked at the relationship between cell size and growth rate for yes. the ancestor, we got a relationship like this. For our evolved guys, we still got a positive relationship, but the slope of that relationship, the allometry, had changed. So, so I can tell you it isn't as simple as Neidhart's question implied, but that doesn't tell you what it is, so uh, I remain very interested in that. I mean, just as an ex mm. So I hope you guys don't mind me keep, these are great questions. So here's an example of another experiment that sheds a little bit of light on the possible explanation. <clears throat> we did a shorter term version of this experiment with, I forget whether it was 12 or 16 strains of E. coli that had been freshly isolated from the wild. And very different genetic backgrounds, presumably. Some of them had come from bat caves in Australia. Another one had come from a jaguar in Central America that had freshly pooped in the jungle. I had a postdoc who knew all these field biologists and collected these things. We put them in this same environment and let them evolve. Now, they started out with a wide range of cell sizes. Some of them were pretty small. Some of them were quite large. All the small ones got large, and the larger ones sort of stayed large. So they kind of converged on a similar cell size. And that made me sort of think about the ecology of our situation and what we've removed. So in nature, cell size is probably subject to all kinds of influences, not just the physiological influences, selective influences that microbiologists might traditionally think about, but for instance, protozoa grazing on them or the surface area that's available for a phage to infect them. And so by bringing them into this laboratory environment, I think we removed a lot of the balance of pressures that would keep them smaller, such as the presence of predators and phages. So it doesn't really explain why they increase, but at least in a sense it sort of says there's some sort of equilibrium and we've perturbed that equilibrium in ways that we don't fully understand. Thank you very much. Uh, did you have a look what was the biochemistry of the citrate use in the mutants? Um, so they definitely are transport, so the problem of uh, bringing, uh, of growing on citrate is that they can't bring it into the cell. They have a TCA cycle and can use citrate once it's inside the cell. Now, bringing carbon in down at the level of that as opposed to bringing it in as glucose is also going to dramatically change many other aspects of the physiology of the cell. So we're pretty confident that a lot of the further evolution in that population is further refinements of this different balance between the carbons they're bringing in, but we have not, you know, we've not pursued that in terms of metabolomics, for example, although we would very much like to do that. But the, the limiting problem was getting it inside the cell. If there are no other burning questions, I'll, I'll invite you all to attend the reception, which will be across the hall in the library, and we very much thank uh, the Institute NICHG for providing it, and thank you for the seminar, and see you there.